Hey all, and welcome back. In this episode, we're going to discuss a different kind of therapy called neurofeedback. This immediately makes me think of Professor X, and yo, I'm so down to be able to read other people's mind and to start my own group of X-Men, but it's not about that. I'm Clint Malley, and this is Real Common Treatable, where we help behavioral health professionals stay at the forefront of adolescent mental health, addiction, and substance use treatment. Our teacher today is Bar Lehman, who owns a clinical practice in Washington, D.C. that specializes in neurofeedback and other therapies. He's also licensed in Virginia. And we're gonna discuss what neurofeedback is, how it is used to treat mental health and addiction, and how it's different from and can be used with traditional therapy and medication treatments. So neurofeedback, yeah, let's jump right in and hear about what it actually is and how Barr became interested in the field. So neurofeedback therapy is a type of therapy where um, you are basically training brain waves in a most broad sense of it. You are training the brain to fire in a new way based on what the symptom is and, and what, what the research shows and, and what the brain map and, and kind of priorities for, for the client. Typically, it's starting with a quantitative EEG. So just like a neurologist takes an electroencephalogram, it, it, it is a recording at say at least 19 sites on the scalp. It's totally non-invasive using the International 1020 system. And you are looking at the brainwave activity at these kind of site locations and looking at things like abnormalities that you know are not necessarily all bad, but things that might be relevant to the kind of symptoms that someone is, is wanting to work on. And after doing that, that's typically the, the, the way that it begins. There is the, the uh, protocol or, or training is, is set based on what is coming up in the brain map and also what the priorities of, of the client is. And so some electrodes are, are hooked up again and feeding that into a computer, which is providing auditory and visual feedback as the person is playing a video game or watching a movie. And during that movie, the screen will become clearer and will hear pleasant little tones in the background when they are getting closer to the desired bandwave ranges. For example, if someone has a slow four to eight hertz rhythm in the frontal cortex, which is one of the classic ADHD phenotypes talked about in the DSM, that's something that is going to be, might be a training protocol and you, you would have an electrode here and whenever you are reducing that slow rhythm then you are going to see the screen clear and hear pleasant tones in the background and so it, it's a metaphor i use also is, is like with biofeedback in general which neurofeedback is a part is if you are wanting to correct your posture you want to look at a mirror because you might not just feel all the time where you're body exactly is in, in space. And so neurofeedback is like that mirror. There's more to it than that, but it, it, it's, it's at its most basic way, it is that mirror and it gives you, you know, immediate feedback. It, it tells you, are you there? Are you hot or are you cold in terms of where you ideally want to be? New research that, that is really pointing that there can be a very strong physiological basis to a lot of the mental health and mental wellness it, it, it is Part of the thing that it drew me to look at integrative approaches when to incorporate with talk therapy, seeing it in, in action, looking for something that has also a type of objectivity that you can say before and after, can we measure a change? This also drew me as an interesting aspect of mental health that I hadn't really heard a lot about in terms of a physiology before and after. Wow, this is a super interesting topic. You're using this device to be able to train certain neurons to fire and actually being able to record and see the measured change within brain activity. So let's find out more about any age restrictions, what conditions can be benefited, and how it may differ from treatment with medications. So that's something that an eight-year-old or six-year-old can be doing just as well as an adult. It's not something that requires any special skill or, or something like that. 
And this is a training. It's just like exercise in so far as it takes repeated sessions. It's based on operant conditioning and heavy and learning, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together, so that you are repeating this over and over. And that creates a longer term change in, in, in the brain, allowing it to enter into say in the case of ADHD, an attentive type, it, it, a more focused, sustained attentional state. It's very well known at, for different conditions. Not every, It's not a silver bullet for every condition, and it's definitely not for every mental health or other conditions. It, it, it has a lot of research behind it, especially for ADHD, anxiety, traumatic brain injury. There's also quite a bit for some other mental health conditions, including epilepsy or physical health included, but, but insomnia, a lot of research behind that and PTSD, Bessel van der Kolk talks about it as a really powerful treatment where many others have not been able to and the body keeps the score where typical medications are not been as effective. Um, there, there's something else at work there. So not that medications don't have their place and some people are viewing neurofeedback as in some kind of opposition to medication, which is re really not the case. There, there is no opposition, but it does have lower chance of side effects. It, it, it is often people are coming because they have had bad side effects or have concerns about medication side effects or tolerance, things like that. And a lot of people find in, certain, in relevant conditions are able to also either have less side effects, reduce dosages, things like that, obviously depending on the, the, the relevance of their symptoms and that kind of thing. Can the EEG be used to diagnose a mental health condition? There's a couple points about EEG. It, it is not going to be a single kind of thing that it is used to diagnose. Diagnoses and the DSM categories are, are complex and they're based on many features. And there's also a lot of contention on what exactly clusters, what types of clusters exist. The NIH has completely ruled out using the DSM because they feel it is not rigorous enough and too tied to financial interests. So that just in itself shows you that there is, you know, differing views on how to, it's not to say that they don't see value in what the DSM is, is having, that there isn't such a thing as depression or, or these things, but how exactly we are classifying these is a complex thing and there are also different interests involved. Now, a, a, a quantitative EEG and an EEG is not going to diagnose, um, you know, you with ADHD. It's not going to diagnose you with, with anything but potentially some type of epileptiform activity, which is another thing in the comprehensive services that I'm providing is, is also something that in, in definitely much higher rates, not that anything like everyone is having them, but especially with mental illnesses, uh, much higher representation in, in mental illness that there is some uh, form of epileptiform activity, even if it's not over the sensory motor strip, but that's a different subject. But I guess what I'm saying in terms of diagnoses is that uh, apart from epileptiform activity, which is an important thing to rule out, especially in cases of treatment resistant mental health issues, that it, it's not going to diagnose it alone. It needs to involve other testing, other discussion with the person just seeing an EEG pattern. But there are phenotypes that are well associated with with mental health issues. It has a lot of research behind it. So that that's something that can be very helpful in, in kind of diagnostically looking at things, but it's not going to diagnose it alone by any means. And it's not going to, it's not used for diagnosis. It's, it's not, neurofeedback is not working strictly by the DSM. It's looking at what the research says behind different biomarkers and what symptoms those are associated. It's more working on symptoms kind of basis of what symptoms are, are, are there versus fitting it into a diagnostic category of the DSM. It's a symptoms, so it's not going to cure, and that's an important thing. It, it's not, it, it cannot be just, just based on, on the research set to cure any of these, but have the working on the symptoms of these conditions. Yes, it has been very impactful research and also experience, but is it going to cure the, the illness itself? No, that, that there's no claim being made that it will cure it but it will, will it help to manage the symptoms? I just wanna be clear on that also, but. Okay, so an EEG alone is not going to give you a diagnosis, but it will provide detailed insight into any unusual background activity within your brain, which may be related to a mental health issue. 
And although it cannot provide a cure, it can provide effective symptom management. So let's find out more about how it can help to manage symptoms. Sometimes it's very helpful in conjunction with say, cognitive behavioral or, or other therapy, depending on whatever is being worked on. And it brings say the level of anxiety down so that therapy can take place much more effectively. In, in that the case, or with PTSD, you gave the example of EMDR, what we would be, you know, working on in, in some cases there, there, there is often a hypervigilance or a uh, difficulty seeing social cues accurately and perceiving the emotion of other people. So that contributes to the hypervigilance. And so bringing that kind of uh, part of the brain that understands social cues and, and that part that, that has to do with hypervigilance to, to a more regulated state, just the training is doing that. It's bringing those things down and, and helping that is it, allowing the person to reduce those certain of those symptoms and will allow them to engage more also in, in therapy as well because when that's not so high being able to verbalize what's going through have the insight it, it becomes a lot easier a lot of mental health conditions they're complex the phrase it takes a village to to raise a kid it takes a, a village it takes a lot of approaches to move through complicated mental health and and other life challenges so there, there's social contexts there is a life history context there is pragmatic cognitive behavioral strategies that are being used to manage things and there are also physiology it, we're not reducing everything to physiology we're not saying all the problems are because of your neurotransmitters for a lot of people that's definitely not the case and maybe for it to, to reduce everything to that is, is not what we're doing but there is one system that is important and sometimes a lot of the variance of what they're experiencing has to do with that physiology knowing that this is implicated that these brainwave states are highly implicated in many mental health issues and some have been better studied than others it's very important not to say for all because there's just not that level of research for all mental health conditions but in knowing that there is a strong relationship to these uh, brainwave states which are associated with neurotransmitters when the you know cells are firing at certain frequencies different neurotransmitters are being active to allow those cells to fire at those frequencies so these things are the, addressing the physiology is more akin to a medication treatment than it is to to a talk therapy so to break it down how does it work you are kind of learning to get into a different state of mind, a different brainwave state by getting this immediate feedback. There's no way to just feel yourself into that, at least maybe, maybe there is, but it is probably a much slower and less rigorous process. But you, you are getting immediate feedback of when you're hot and cold based on the protocol that the clinician sets. And so you are able to learn to adjust your kind of brainwaves to a state that you are likely to feel significantly less of the symptoms that, that you are working on. It, it, it's very much, once you are training the brain to do it, it doesn't require necessarily other steps. I think it would be helpful to learn about the process of neurofeedback through an example. So let's say a 13 year old Sally comes in with her parents and she has ADHD. This is the first step of the process. It's called an assessment kids who, who is having trouble to focus in class and is, is you know constantly distracted with with other things will kind of have an easier time accessing a, a brainwave state that has maybe less of that slower activity and it's not necessarily something that must be verbally talked about which is another benefit to it because especially with adolescents and children there might be limited ability to get through in a verbal way to some of these feelings and, and kind of concepts. First is a consultation and assessment. ADHD, inattentive symptoms, especially in, in kids who have a difficult time as verbalizing, is there a huge life stressor that suddenly happened? Are our parents going through something? Has there been a loss in the family? Like just ruling out certain things, attentional issues. Is it, if, if it is clear that it, it is ADHD and, and not related to some other event, we are um, see, seeing have, have other things also. Is this the first thing that they, they, they are trying? What, what other approaches have been used? Have they tried anything? It, usually people are coming when, when there is some trouble with other 
approaches too. Sometimes people are coming specifically for the neurofeedback. So just getting more of a sense of what they are wanting to get out of it, what the symptoms look like. ADHD is not always manifesting in the same way. And making sure we have a comprehensive understanding of, of the, the symptoms. Is there is anxiety a big part of it for some people? Step number two is a brain map. Past that, we are doing a brain map. So the child and their mom or, or whoever comes in, they are sitting for an hour and a half with kind of a cap that looks like a swimmer's cap. And there's recording 10 minutes of the eyes closed condition because the brain waves look a little bit different when the eyes are closed versus eyes are open. And that sheds some important light on what's happening. And we, we are recording for 20 minutes, but the whole process takes longer than that. And I'm um, explaining to, 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 the, to Sally what we're doing and breaking that down, developing some, some relationship with, with, with them through that process. Step number three is an analysis and report completed by a neurologist. And after that, there, there will be an analyses and, and report by neurologist. And when coming back a couple of weeks later, we'll look through the report and see how it matches up with some of the things that the client wants to work on or their parents. So say with ADHD, we are seeing, we are looking for three types of phenotypes, so three brainwave patterns. I don't need to get into to the specifics there, but we'll see if one of those are showing up, then we would have a conversation on what that kind of treatment recommendation. So what we would be training, what brainwaves we would be training based on that, giving them a full report of the pictures of that, both in the raw data, as well as the kind of quantitative higher level maps, some of the kind of the, the frequencies there. And step number four is to begin treatment sessions with positive verbal reinforcement. And then we could begin a, usually 30 sessions are, are recommended, no, no less. More severe cases can take longer, but for ADHD, typically 30, 40 sessions has been found to be pretty efficacious. And so if that's the only thing that we, we would talk about that and usually before that too, in terms of what's expected. But, and then the, the Sally's coming in once, twice, maybe three times even a week and watching a movie on, on Netflix Kids, something like that perhaps. and. Um, to just something that, that will be, you know, engaging to them, age appropriate, something that, um, yeah, that, that, that also really helps with kids who might not really understand or really want to be there. So having a Netflix show is often a nice treat for them. It's, it works well for the parents and then the kids. And while they're doing it, they're getting, you know, the, the, the treatment. So having explained at the beginning to, to, to her what, what that would look like. So she's watching the movie, seeing the screen dim when she's further from the desired brainwave state, and also hearing the bings, and, and that's a positive thing. And in, in the background, those are positive beeps that tell her while the screen is clearing that she's on the right track. So I will provide some positive feedback as well when I see her, the numbers are moving in the right direction, say, you're doing a great job, be, be, be supporting and coaching her, her through. And that's something that, that builds throughout the sessions that she is more easily able to enter into that state. And there is a learning curve to, towards the end, it becomes easier. And, um, but the threshold also still makes it tough enough. So it's not that the screen just stays clear all the time. And so that would be the general trajectory of, of the therapy. But what if the screen dims and Sally's brain is getting farther away from the desired state? How do you get her back on track? Yeah, I would maybe would tell them if, if, say in the case of Sally with, with the ADHD, and how are you feeling right now? Are you feeling focused? Are you feeling less focused? A, a lot of this is important to also understand. A lot of it is passive. So this neurofeedback research was, was also done a lot with animals who are not necessarily that it is quite effective with animals as well. So the point here is a lot is happening under the surface without a conscious willpower being exerted because you are learning a lot of operant conditioning does not need to be conscious. There's a lot of research that we are can learn things without it, it being, and so can animals. The, the whole Pavlov's dog, it's not that they are thinking about it, but the operant conditioning is, is uh, of, of the reward. They are still, it is a natural reward to have the screen clear. And to hear these pleasant bings too is definitely helpful for that. So it's something that is, is in the works, even if it is something that the kid doesn't really understand. And, and some people, it, it, it's a, 
kind of a strange concept, but, but it, it, it works. And, and that's what the research shows as well. So Sally has completed all her sessions. Let's see what aftercare looks like. And after 30 sessions, we are checking in, seeing how, and then also intermittently with the parent, with the kid, checking in after we have 24 hour reports. So checking in about any side effects that might've been in the session and, and, and especially the main symptoms. So has there been a change? Making those concrete. Obviously there's a lot of variables, but if there are ways that we can break down, what, what do we want to see change? In what context would it manifest? What would that look like? And so having a very clear treatment plan based on that is an essential part as well, obviously. It certainly sounds like neurofeedback helps to manage symptoms, but is it something that you have to work on? Like, do I have to consciously change my mindset or practice mindfulness to make it work for me? With um, neurofeedback is almost always done passively. There are certain types of neurofeedback that's been shown to be done that the learning curve works better in an active way, like alpha up training, but almost all neurofeedback has, has shown, you know, really robust, you know, results with passive training. This is different from biofeedback, which is like heart rate variability training and, and urinary incontinence, things that are you, you are putting effort for. So it's an interesting thing and, and sounds, you know, strange to people, but it's a very powerful felt effect. And whether you are struggling with, with anxiety symptoms or, or it is your self-regulation with ADHD impulsivity or, 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 or with the PTSD related symptoms of hypervigilance, it's something that can be often in very good conjunction with therapy, bringing that level of arousal so it isn't interfering with, with the therapeutic process as much. And it can be a benefit also on its own, but it, it, it isn't something that you are necessarily needing to have a lot of concepts thinking I am now entering into this state or exiting it. So I, I think that different thing that then say mindfulness, which is also can be really important. And for a lot of these things, it's not ruling it out, but the neurofeedback process is not something that you need to have a lot of conscious intention to make it work or to bring it outside of the therapeutic room. It's something that, that, that is going to be a part of the repertoire of brain states that the person can enter into and naturally will fall more into through the course of the treatment. Okay, so you don't have to consciously work on changing your mindset. Your brain is working on that in the background but can it work on multiple diagnoses at once? I, I, I think that neurofeedback is definitely that there's no, often people are having multiple, I, I, I think, diagnoses. It, it, it's really, um, especially when they come to neurofeedback, it's typically not the first thing that they've tried. It's not the thing that it, it, everybody, I, I think, has tried. Typically people are trying therapy and, and, and medications before, though not always. So I, I would say it's definitely not uncommon. And I do think that neurofeedback has a unique ability to be helpful in case dual diagnosis, not all dual diagnosis, it depends on the condition, but say ADHD and anxiety, which I, I think is a you know very relevant one also for neurofeedback because the combination of anxiety and we are not in neurofeedback, we go by the brain map. We don't go by the, the diagnosis in terms of providing the, the treatment, but th there can be, it's not in every case, a mixture of kind of fast and slow activity, which can create a very difficult time for many medications to address the symptoms. For some ADHD with very fast activity that's happening because of anxiety, if you're prescribing a stimulant, that can make the anxiety so much worse. And if you are having at the same time slower frontal waves in the cortex, they, they waves here, that is going to need some speeding up. So that 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 is that's what methylphenidate does. It, it, it increases you know the speed of the waves in, in the frontal cortex. So that, that's a very good fit as long as it's not having side effects. And but if you are having anxiety with that, it can be often you are having this mixture of fast and slow issues. So neurofeedback can target both of that. And, and, and many people are coming after feeling that the medications have not really been able to work or had side effects that haven't allowed things to work easily. Neurofeedback is not only effective for people with mental health issues, it can also help people struggling with addiction. 
with alcoholism, but, but others too, a lot of biomarkers associated with addiction, including with, with alcoholism in particular. And this has been very clearly related to genes regulating the GABA receptors. And that is something that brings the brain into a more relaxed state. And with it's much higher percentage of people with alcoholism who have brains that are on hyperdrive. They are called low voltage fast. And not, not getting into the weeds, but basically there is a particular presentation of the brain that would be worked on through here that something like a talk therapy is not going to be addressing. It can still be helpful. It's not saying that we are the only way someone can, can work on that. But that, that that's also why some people are saying, I've heard that this is something that can be very meaningful for working on challenges with that. The anterior cingulate is another target in a lot of addictive you know, disorders. So it, it, it can be because they've seen or known someone to improve a lot with neurofeedback. It's incorporated in a lot of addiction treatment centers. I want to hear about the top reasons why someone might use neurofeedback rather than medication or therapy. I think it is complex because different conditions and interests might lead you to neurofeedback even before you try other things. And for, for a lot of cases too, sometimes you may come to neurofeedback because other things haven't worked and you've heard someone who has you know tried neurofeedback and had meaningful changes from that. So it's hard to give a hard and fast answer. I, I think that people are, are coming to it as is Maybe they've tried other things and, and found the medication approach, the therapy, they are hitting some blocks and feeling that it, it, and it, it, I think, can be a meaningful thing in many cases where there are these blocks or a block in entering fully into therapy, feeling that there is this anxiety or, or something that has made it more difficult to get in touch with what they are feeling or, or, or things like that. With, with ADHD, it's not necessarily just about developing cognitive behavioral coping strategies there. It's classified as a neurobiological you know, condition. So there, there are a lot of different biomarkers with that, but that, that might be a reason on its own to come. It can also be because other things have failed and neurofeedback can provide information and a way forward, whether it's through the neurologist report and whether it's through just the treatment protocols. I'd say those are the two main ones because they have failed to improve on other modalities and that they also have known this to address kind of a, a component that seems key, the, the, the underlying physiology. Listen, y'all, we know that struggles with mental health and addiction are real, but they're also more common than people think. And thankfully, with the help and support of professionals like you and neurofeedback, it's also treatable. So let's get out there and empower and inspire somebody today. All of my love, and I will see you on the next episode.